Meet me tonight, if you would, in Matthew chapter 19. I want to start with just a few verses this evening, and I want to read a text. I want to treat this a little bit like we're in a streaming era. We're in a lot, we watch a lot of movies, and we watch a lot of TV. We've moved past that era where that's um, too unholy to talk about in church. I remember those days. I mean, people were going home and watching them, pulling them out of their closets and watching them, and then when everybody leave, put it back in the closet because they didn't want to have a TV. Okay, we got past that when you put one in your palm of your hand, started using it as a phone, yeah. using it as a phone, <laughs> whatever. It's a TV that happens to make phone calls. So now that we're sort of in that world and we think in the terms of blocking and cameras and film and television and plot and drama and story, I want to I wanna pull a little Hollywood trick on you tonight and I want to show you a scene with a bunch of characters. You're going to know them because you've read your Bible, but we're going to jump into the middle of a story and we're going to watch a scene, kind of like that scene that opens the movie and everything's happening and you're going, what's going on? Who, who, what, who's this guy? I don't know. What, how, why would you start a movie like this? Then a screen goes black and it says... Three days earlier, you know, that, and you go, oh, okay, I know what they're doing. They're going to bring us back to that. So I want to start on that chaotic moment, and then we'll go back just a little bit in time, and I don't know that we'll land on the exact same chaotic moment, but we'll take you through the same characters and the same plot line so that you'll know why we start where we start in a text that is, it's quoted far more than it's preached, and those intrigue me. I can't help it because I'm intrigued by the stuff we pass by as compliments to other stuff. And Jesus wasn't complimenting anything. He was saying something and he meant it when he said it. And here's what it sounds like. Matthew 19, 13, then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. And in this scene, chaos is probably a good word, because if you've ever been around a bunch of kids, chaos is a good word to describe it. And here comes a busload of kids running up to Jesus, and they swamp the master, and you know what that scene must look like. Kids jumping all over Jesus, jumping on his back, pulling at his beard, jumping into his lap. And the disciples have a moment of absolute secret service-like panic <laughs> because of the threat that is a group of kids. So we must get these toddlers off of the master lest someone pull out his beard or tug on his cape. I don't know. They're freaking out. And I, I want to leave the words in red for a moment. That's the sandwich. That's the meat to the sandwich. It's three verses. Let's deal with the bread, top and bottom. We come back a moment into the meat of the plot. But on the exterior is this. He lay, wanted to lay his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them, and it doesn't take much of a stretch for all of us to agree that if we are disciples, the last thing we want to be known as are the people who rebuke people who come to Jesus. That, that's not the legacy that we put on our business card. And I, I, none of us want that. I don't think the disciples necessarily wanted that to make it to print, but it did. The day that they rebuke a bunch of kids for coming. He said, I know, and when you re-say it, it's even worse. Remember that moment we rebuked a bunch of kids in the name of Jesus? <laughs> in the name of Jesus. As they come to Jesus, I rebuke you, little Tommy, in the name of Jesus. Get out of here. <laughs> I don't know what it looked like, but I know it doesn't look good. I don't know what it sounded like, but it doesn't sound good. And I don't really know what it would look like today, but I think it would look something like this. Someone claims to follow Jesus that you think, based upon the way they look, live, act, walk, or talk, can't possibly be a Christian, and therefore you say, don't call yourself a follower of my Jesus if you look like that, dress like that, act like that, and talk like that. And I know it sounds real holy going down, but it just might put you on the wrong side of Matthew's history someday, whenever another generation looks back and goes, hey, remember that time when that guy rebuked you for coming to Jesus? 
So maybe lay off the rebuking all the people for coming to Jesus. That's one thing we can do with this text. As you imagine, there's probably some more. At the end of it, he laid his hands on them and departed from there in what a moment. A bunch of jumping kids pulling his hair, jumping on his lap, running around in circles, and Jesus isn't kicking kids out, throwing them to the side. But he's doing the age-old move, the move he learned from his fathers, from the rabbis. He takes that hand of blessing, and he drops it down onto the heads of each of those little kids. I like to think he takes their little faces in his hands, and he just speaks the love of his father into those children. What a moment. Can you imagine being that kid? And as you grow older and hear about that Jesus that you had a little passing glance with when you were a kid, and you maybe you remember it, maybe you don't, but that moment, that hand, that same hand that will be nail-scarred and spread out for the world, laid its hand on your head, and it didn't just give some passing bless you, but he spoke something into your existence. It's a, it's a, it's a foreshadow of our inheritance in Christ. It's a foreshadow of our salvation when Christ takes that nail-scarred hand and he lays it across who you are and he brings you into his dad's inheritance. He brings you into the kingdom because that's what forefathers do. They, the forebears lay that hand of blessing on another generation and they pass along whatever it is that they have into their lives. And so we watch Jesus do that. But we hear Jesus say this, and I think this is what I meant by we quote this, but we don't preach this, because I don't think we think there's a lot of meat on the bone here, and I think we're wrong. Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, of such is the kingdom of heaven. And as I let that hang there, it's a familiar phrase. I'm not reading a verse you haven't seen 10 times before. In fact, I'm not even reading a verse that doesn't reappear in other versions of the Synoptic Gospels as the other Gospel writers, which we're going to see in a moment, put their own little twist here and there on this little moment, on this little story. But in our ear, it basically sounds like this. Let the humble and the innocent and the children come to me because when you come into the kingdom that's what you're going to end up being is the humble and the innocent and the, com- and, the, and the cute and the precious and the sinless. And I think because we kind of already have it figured out that that's us as kingdom people, we sort of move past this verse and miss the lesson. Black screen. Three days earlier. <laughs> Mark chapter 9. Because when you think you got the scene figured out, odds are they put it at the beginning of the movie to confuse you. There's a little bit of context you need to round out what's happening. Here's a little bit of that context leading up. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 30. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying, and were afraid to ask him. I pause here for a moment. They did not understand this saying, and were afraid to ask him. I wonder what it was that they didn't understand That seems fairly straightforward. I reread it. The Son of Man's being betrayed into the hands of men. That seems pretty clear. They will kill him. Doesn't get any deader than that. And after he's killed, he will rise the third day. Three basic points. What'd you miss? Someone's going to betray me. I'm going to die. Three days later, I'm going to come back from the dead. And yet, and I'm not mocking the disciples, but and yet their response is mute. They didn't understand it and were afraid to ask him, which leads me to the next inevitable question. Why are you scared to just ask? It's Jesus. Does he usually cuss you out when you ask him what he meant? Does he get ticked off? Did I not speak loud enough the first time? Why you would have to ask me? And you know the answer is no, which tells me that they don't ask because they don't want to know the answer. That's why we don't ask. The question you don't ask is the one you don't want to know, and I warn you, when you start asking questions, be careful. The answer you get will rarely be the one you want, and it'll tell you why you never asked in the first place, because when you get it, you'll go, oh yeah, now I remember why I left that alone. Note to self, don't ask that. 
And so the disciples don't want to know the answer to the question because the reality is, and I'm not mocking them and cutting them down, I'm putting myself in their shoes. I don't think I would have asked either because I don't want him to clarify, because I don't want it to be right, because what he said is simple. One of you, someone's going to betray me. He's going to round that out in John and go, guess who it is? It's one of you that eats bread with me. Someone's going to betray me. I am actually going to die, and I'm going to raise in three days. And the reason I don't want to ask him to re-explain is because if he's right, he can't be the Messiah because Messiahs don't die. And I hitched everything on this star. I left my profitable fishing business. I turned my tax collector table over. I left crops in the field to follow this man. If he goes and dies, we haven't done anything. Not really. I mean, you call feeding some hungry people and walking on the water world-changing. No, Caesar's still in power. Those jerks in the temple are still keeping people out that need to be in. Nothing's really happened. In fact, things have kind of gotten worse. I mean, at least used to, we could go to the temple. Now we've got to avoid it lest they stone him to death. There's infighting amongst our group over which of us would possibly die with him in case he gets taken out to be executed. This isn't what I signed up for. I'm not going to ask the question because I don't want to know the answer because the answer might be he's either A, not the Messiah, or B, not the Messiah I wanted. And so we move on. Don't bother with the question. And when, let's try this, when a question comes up, that you don't want to answer, what do you typically do? You quickly change the subject. That's a smooth move, right? You ask me something I don't want to know, I act like I didn't hear, I say what, I drop stuff, accidentally kick things, suddenly something that was completely unimportant a moment ago is the most important thing in the history of the world, I got to talk about it, got to go do it. To avoid that topic, and so we go back to the scene. Then he comes to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? Time out. One verse earlier, they wouldn't ask Jesus what he meant because they were scared. So they start murmuring among themselves because when you don't want to ask the question, the best thing you can do is just change the subject. And so that's exactly what they do. And as they change the subject, they begin to murmur amongst themselves. And Jesus, who knows what's going on, he knows what's up, goes, hey, what were you guys talking about back there on the road? Verse 34 says, but they kept silent because on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. I would keep silent too. (laughs) Jesus told me something I didn't want to hear, so I went off and gossiped with my buddies, and when Jesus called me on to gossip, I go, I didn't say anything. (laughs) Shift cam reviews. We went back three days. Yes, I love this plot device. I love this, this cinematography choice in film. When you watch a scene and then something feels odd, the scene almost feels like it starts over and you realize that it has, but the cinematographer, the director made a choice to show you camera B from the beginning of the shot and you go, ooh, something's happening. We get to see this from another angle. That thing we just saw, we get to see it again. We're not seeing another scene. We're seeing the same scene through someone else's eyes. We're getting to watch it through another lens. This is what I love about the Gospels, is the Gospels puts multiple cameras on the same shot, and if you'll read it parallel, you can stop the scene, start over, and switch to camera C, and go, ooh, this is something we didn't see, and then they flew that drone camera over, and we went, oh, look at what happens there. Yeah, I didn't get that angle, didn't see that before. Don't look at that as an incongruency in the Bible, as if the Bible is contradicting itself. Look at it as the Bible is fleshing out a scene with multiple shots. And when you flesh out a scene with multiple shots, you get multiple angles. And when you get multiple angles, camera C would swear camera A is not telling the whole story. Because camera C doesn't see what camera A sees. And so when you start to look from different angles, you see different things. So let's look at a different angle. And to do that, we go back to Matthew, to Matthew chapter 18 in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Time out. Here's the story. They didn't have the nerve to ask him in the other shot. 
Remember when the camera was on them and they were just kind of whispering among themselves and Jesus goes, what are you guys talking about? And they wouldn't tell him. Another camera had a microphone hidden somewhere and picked up on it and said, no, I am going to tell you exactly what those disciples are saying. Who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And I'll give you yet another timeout. Please indulge me. I have fun in the word. And so I got to take multiple timeouts because we got to slow down a little bit and bring this thing together and shore it up just a little bit. So go on the ride if you would for a moment. I think it's amazing that you can ask Jesus anything you want. You are a disciple. You can fire off massive theological questions. You can get to the heart of the universe. You can ask about velociraptors. You can do anything you want to do. I don't need an email either from anyone going, no one knew about the velociraptor. You missed the point of this portion of the sermon, so you need to start over. And yet, what do they ask him? <laughs> Who gets to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Why you would ask Jesus, who gets to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And it's not just a strange question. It's an even stranger answer. Because if you're going to ask a dumb question... I had a professor one time that said, there are no stupid questions. There are just stupid people who ask questions. <laughs> so I felt like he was talking to me. I stopped asking. <laughs> okay, I get what you're saying, but I got a question. So listen to his answer. Then Jesus called a little child to him and said to him in the midst of them, him is an improper Genitive reflexive here. It's, it's, it's a neutered reflexive in the Greek. This is not a little boy. It could be a little boy or a little girl. This is a classic example of the English taking everything into the male gender when it brings it out of the Greek. They're not always in the male gender. And in this case, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl. It doesn't really matter because the Greek word is used for child. So it, it isn't an indicator that it's a boy child or a girl child. So I'm not going to try to preach some sort of form out of that that doesn't exist there in the Greek. So forgive the English for putting the pronoun him in the midst because it isn't necessarily a him, but we will just have a boy. You can have a girl there. It doesn't matter. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. What do we do with this? Jesus doesn't really answer the question that was asked. What was the question? Who gets to be the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus ignores the question, but not really. Instead, he brings a little child up onto his knee, and he says, this is what it looks like. If you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, I'm ignoring your greatest question for a moment. You asked me about who gets to be the best. But the problem is, is that you're not even really sure what it means to get in. So let's don't worry about who gets to be the best. Let's start with the baseline of what gets you in. If you'd start with the baseline of what gets you in, I promise you by learning what gets you in, you would learn how insignificant it is to be the best. So you're asking a question, but it's the wrong question. So I'll help you ask a better question, he says. Here's a child, and unless you get converted and become as this child, unless you humble yourself as this child, and then you don't know the kingdom or have a place in the kingdom. How do we handle this? And whether or not you do, as I suspect we all have done, and quote this inside of another sermon, or you do the thing of preaching this all by itself, your landing spot is your landing spot, and it's worthy. But I want to give you one tonight that maybe isn't your landing spot. Is that okay? And together, maybe we wrestle out something different, something to at least think about. Because here has been, for the most part, my landing spot. Childhood is wonderful. Childhood is desirable. Childhood is idyllic. Childhood is innocent. So when Jesus says, unless you become like a child, he's encouraging you to do what we see in children. Lose your dependency. Be excited for the little things. 
Don't worry about tomorrow. Everything I'm describing to you is toddler knowledge. But it's enviable knowledge, right? I mean, I think it is. To not worry about tomorrow, to be innocent in thought, word, and deed, to be entirely trusting, to have no fear, and when you do have fear, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas are right there to assuage all of your fears and to slay all of your dragons and to defeat all the monsters under your bed and to always check the nightlight. That's the beauty of being a kid. And then when you see one, you can't help but smile. They're so cute and fun and funny, especially when they're someone else's. And you don't have to clean all of the stuff that comes out of cute and fun and funny. But you got little chubby cheeks and little fat thighs and all that good stuff that makes babies all wonderful and their head smells good. You ever notice that? It's just it smells good all the time. And so that's how I've preached this, is to go, that's what we have to do. Humble ourselves as children and become innocent. Humble ourselves as children and become trusting. Humble ourselves as children and be cute. I know we don't preach that last one, but we're kind of there. That's kind of what we are. Oh, look at you, you little cutie in the eyes of Abba. Daddy loves you, you little stink pot. That's what it means to get into the kingdom. And that kind of leads us into the second phase of how we preach it, which is to take everybody off the hook and basically say, when you came into Jesus, he made you innocent. You came in as if you are a little child. In other words, you don't actually have to do anything in this verse. Just read it and smile. Because when you came to Christ, he made you like a baby and you're totally innocent, all is good. And if that's the case, then you don't really need this story. It's kind of an insignificant episode in a series you like, but you could have skipped. You ever have those? What we call throwaway episodes? You get to the end of it and you go, they could have done without that. That one character has not even been in any episodes before. We didn't advance the plot at all. Main character wasn't in but like three minutes. We could have done without that. And I, we preach a lot of Bible stories that way. We preach a lot of Jesus stories that way, like, yeah, you probably could have done without that one. It's really not that big of a deal. We just kind of move past it. And we've allowed the understanding of grace in the new covenant to kind of do that to us because sometimes we go, well, Christ has done all of that anyway. This verse doesn't really apply to you. And look, I get it that there are contextual verses that you do not need to go do. When Jesus says to the lepers, go show yourself to Moses for the purification of leprosy, that's context bound. Like, there's nothing for you to do with that in the natural realm. If you get a healing, you're not going to go resuscitate temple worship so you can stand in front of a priest and make sure it actually was pure. So, yes, I get it that there's contextually bound. But I thought Jamie said it so well today. No double, no double fulfillments of prophecies. But let's not kid ourselves. Christ, who knows how to speak prophecy, knows how to speak beyond just the prophecy to apply it into our lives in other ways across time because he is he who was, he who is, and he who ever shall be. If he was a good prophet then, he's a good prophet now. And he'll be a good prophet tomorrow. So maybe Jesus demands a return to innocence. Maybe he demands a purity and a carefree life. But I would, sorry to bust your bubble. I don't think we are so lucky. And here is why. In Jesus' day, up until at least the middle of the 1800s, children were the lowest rank of human society, lower than slaves, lower than property. In fact, children were by and large seen as less than a human condition so badly that one needed to beat the foolishness out of the heart of the child. And for centuries, Childhood was not goo goo gaga, isn't that cheat cute? Childhood was considered the lowest rung, the least contributive to the family and to society, and it was meant to be as short as possible. When a young lady hit puberty, she was to marry 
and get pregnant quickly. The average lifespan in the time of Christ was in the, er the low 30s. The reason for that was not because there were not old people, but because there were so many infant deaths and moms who died in bearing children, and there were so, many, so much loss of life that some statistics say you had odds of greater than 50% of being dead before you turned three. Childhood was a drain, for the most part, psychologically, to the society. When Jesus pulls a child onto his knee, the context of that child was, I bring to you one of life's little losers. I bring to you the lowest end of the totem pole, the bottom rung. This which is overlooked in every room. This which contributes nothing but takes only. This who is not respected and who no one takes serious. It is a modern phenomenon. I am not trying to present to you this is correct. Right, right. Trying to present to you this was the fact. Facts are not always correct, though they be true. You understand what I'm saying? It is a modern phenomenon that kids matter. It is a modern phenomenon that they are paid attention to as if they are adults. That where they want to eat is as important as where you want to eat. That what they want to do holds as much weight as what you want to do. Some of it changes as we get older, but I'm talking about society as a whole. What I mean by some of it changes as we get older is I tell my kids, your Mimi and Pawpaw are not the people that raised me. <laughs> they look a little bit like them, but they are not the people that raised me. Things have changed. Now that's on the, that's on the micro, but on the macro, in the society of Jesus' day, the child did not hold the place that it holds in our heart. It did not hold the place, I think, that it even should hold in our heart. And Jesus, confined to the context of his day, grabs an illustration every one of them will understand when they say, who gets to be the greatest? And he picks the last thing anyone there would have picked as great. And he grabs it and he puts it on his knee. And he loves it because our Jesus rejects nothing, even the lowest end of the totem pole. In fact, he feels really comfortable around them. Yeah. Yeah. Dare I push the envelope a little farther? The man who is a, accused of being a glutton and a wine-bibber, friends of tax collectors and sinners, is comfortable with kids because it's the same company in their day. And so when he pulls the child onto his knee, what Jesus is showing you and me and his disciples is that the kingdom of God is not made up of the good and the powerful and the mighty and the learned and the respected. But when you come follow me, the reason why you don't want to ask me what I meant by in three days I die is because the answer you don't want to hear is I came to die because that's how daddy wins is when we die and let God do something brand new inside of us and that's not an attractive savior to sign up to follow and the reason you didn't want to ask me twice Jesus, I think, is saying, is because you were afraid that I would say, yes, not only am I going to die, I have to die. And yes, if your follow-up question is, what about us? So do you. And so the child that is on Jesus' knee represents the scandal of following Jesus. Because I don't know if you know it or not, but when we signed up to follow Jesus, we entered into a divine scandal. 
What Jesus does at Calvary is the great scandal. What Jesus does at Calvary is he goes to a cross and he dies and the Romans only kill vagabonds and strangers and criminals on crosses and kings do not die on crosses. Generals do not die on crosses. The mighty do not die on crosses. To die on a cross means that you are a certified, bona fide loser. And Jesus knows we don't want to ask the question again for fear that the invitation to follow him will mean that we too come in to the kingdom having admitted that we are one more big, fat, bona fide loser who has found our life in him. Let me lose my life for his sake, Jesus said. He who loses his life for my sake, the same man shall find it. What did he mean? If not, once you lay down everything that you are, then you come in through me, and I and my Father make our home in you because I can only make my home in that which has laid itself down. And so the child bounces on his knee. And Jesus, working within the context of his time, shows us what the qualifications are for the kingdom. Let me show you how Paul handles this a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I told you a moment ago about the scandal of the cross. I have a personal theory that the apostle Paul does what he can in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians to redeem the cross. And what I mean by redeem the cross, not as if it needed to get saved, but to save it from the mentality that it was a failure. Just to give you a little perspective on the cross, the cross in Christ's day would have been about as exciting as the electric chair in our day. I think... How stunned would you be to see people wearing electric chairs around their neck? On chains. Now, I'm not in any way faulting wearing the cross. We know what the cross is for children of God, but I just want you to put yourself in the mentality of what the disciples thought when Jesus said, If any man's gonna come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. They, they heard, this is what it would sound like to you. If any man's gonna come after me, go ahead and put in your request for your last meal because you're walking that green mile. You can hang that on a chain if you want to. You can tattoo it on your deltoid, but you're going down. That's what it represents. You're going down so that you can come up because the seed of corn's got to go into the ground and die, and then it can bring forth that fruit. Now, the disciples heard that, thought that, watched Jesus die. As Jamie brought out today, at least a couple of them on the road to Emmaus didn't there, 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 was a, there was a thought of abject failure. We thought he was the one who would redeem Israel, they said. I, by the way, like to think that Cleopas is not walking with another guy. I like to think that Cleopas is walking with his wife. I like to imagine that Cleopas and his wife are the new Adam and Eve on the road to Emmaus. And the first Adam and Eve had their eyes opened, eating the wrong tree. And the last, the second Adam and Eve had their eyes opened, eating from the right tree. In either case, there was a thought of failure. This cross was a failure, and how can we follow this one who died on a cross? In fact, in the Jewish tradition, specifically the fifth book of Torah, Deuteronomy, the text is very clear, cursed is any man that hangs on a tree. It would take Paul writing his letter to the Galatians to redeem that passage and go, yes, indeed, cursed is a man who hangs on a tree. But let me tell you what that means because of Jesus. But that ought to be in your mind as you think about a cross, as they watched him die on the cross. Why do you think the Jewish leaders wanted him to die on a cross and not stoned to death? Because if he can die on a cross, they can legally vis-a-vis -vis legally by Torah say God cursed him because God has to because that's what happens if you die on a piece of wood. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 says, for Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews. He is a stumbling block, a scandalon in the Greek, which is the word we get in the English of a scandal. To the Jews, it is a scandal to preach the cross because 
And to the Greeks, it is foolishness to preach it, but to those of us who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. That last phrase is incredible. Paul is positing to his Corinthian audience that while you look at the cross and see it as a scandal because only criminals, vagabonds, and strangers die on crosses, how can a Savior die on a cross? It is the wisdom of God that puts himself on a cross because knowing that you had an appointment with death, he went to death for you. That's God's wisdom. That's God's love on display because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And there's a lot here I'd love to stop and talk about, but we're on our way to something. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many why. Okay, get ready to get insulted. You ready? The scandal of the cross going to drag a big net. We're all in it. Are you ready? Remember, he put a child on his knee in a society where the child is the lowest end of the ladder. And then he went to the cross and died in the worst possible way where they hang you naked and kill you as a criminal. And this is what we signed up to follow. Surely I'm the exception, you say. Well, Paul says, you see your calling, brother. Not many of you are wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty. Not many noble are called. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty the base things of the world, the things that are despised, God has chosen, the things which are not, to bring to nothing, the things that are, that no flesh, no flesh, how much of us, how many of us, no flesh gets to glory in the presence of God. I'm amazed at how often I have quoted these verses when I find out that somebody that I think is of low intelligence, somebody that I think is low on the totem pole, somebody that I think is an outsider, Somebody that I think is an outcast does something great for God. And I go, man, ain't it amazing? God chooses the foolish things. Confound the wise. Man. Won't he do it? And what I don't realize is that Paul doesn't disqualify me in this text, which means I got to read myself into this. You don't have to read yourself into if you don't want to, but I'm going to go ahead and take the journey. God chose good old Paul White, one of the foolish things in the world to put to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world like Paul White to put to shame things that are mighty. He chose the base things of the world like Paul White, things which are despised in the way Paul White's despised. God chose that guy and the things that are not like Paul White to bring to nothing a bunch of things that are. That no Paul Whites ever get to glory in God's presence. No matter how good he thinks he is, no Paul White ever gets any credit. He never gets any glory. And so that in Christ, Christ can be his wisdom. Christ can be his righteousness. Christ can be his sanctification. And Christ can be his redemption. So let it be written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. You don't have anything to brag about. I'm the child on the knee. So granted, you are the child on the knee. It just isn't what you thought it was. It's not cute, bubbly, bouncy, chunky, cheek, little fat thighs. Look how precious you are, you innocent little thing. Father loves you. He's so cute, sinless because of the new covenant. But maybe what Jesus is saying is, you want to know what the kingdom's made up of? All the people you overlooked, stepped on, forgot about, ignored, left alone, left out. The people you just tried to rebuke when they walked up here. Bring me one of those and quit asking me who gets to be the best when you don't even know what it means to get in. You say, well, am I in? Being in is in Christ. Being in is in Christ. We are in because of the scandal of the cross. But understand that what in looks like, ah, that's the key. Oh, yes, we're in, but what's in look like? In looks like I know I can't do this. I know I'm the guy that's the foolish, weak, shameful, base, despised stuff of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's not simply Jesus on Calvary that looked that way. It's me in Jesus on Calvary that looks that way so that I can live the life of the resurrected and have all of that stuff from verse 30. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Where? In Christ. 
black screen. <laughs> if all else fails and you can't get what you want, bring your mama. Matthew chapter 20. <laughs> Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him. Oh, yeah. The AD 30 Karen. <laughs> Her boys came home and said, you ain't gonna believe what Jesus said to us today. We asked him a simple question and he dragged these little low lowlifes out there and said, this is what it's going to look like to get into the kingdom. Mom, I don't think that's fair. And she went, we're going to go have a talk with somebody. <laughs> right now, we're going to get this right. As embarrassed as I would have been for the question, who gets to be the best? Matthew 2020, 20, I'm done being a disciple. I'm, I'm out. I don't think I can live up to this. Mom shows up. On the scene, <laughs> at least she kneels down and asks something from him in a praise posture. And he says, what do you wish? I love it. Jesus knows she wants something. Isn't he good? Yeah. He goes, you ain't ever been here before. It's because you want something, Karen. <laughs> you ain't ever asked for the manager to tell me it was good. Uh, not a time have we got your latte right that you said, bring him out here. I want to congratulate him. So I know somebody didn't pump enough on that latte machine. He said, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may set one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm able to drink and be baptized with the baptize, baptism I'm baptized with? And they amazingly say to him, we are able. Now, I want to give the benefit of the doubt. I, not, 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 that's the wrong phrase. I want to give honor where honor is due. James and John may not understand the theology of the question, but they nail the theology of the answer. Because you are able. The spirit is willing. The flesh is often weak. You are able to do what needs to be done. It's why Jesus drags a child out into the story to say, be converted and become like this. If it's impossible, he wasn't going to say it. There is a way for you to realize that your salvation is death in Christ and resurrection into a new reality. There's a way for you to walk into that revelation. There's a way to you to comprehend that. There's a way to you, for you to accept that and have that they say we are able, and he says, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with my baptism I'm baptized with, but to set on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. You are indeed going to do what needs to be done. You are going to drink the cup that needs to be drank, the same cup that Jesus takes in Gethsemane. You take into you when you fellowship with his sufferings. You take into you the opportunity to put you there with Christ and see you there with him in a resurrection. Jesus says that is indeed what the kingdom is all about. There are some aspects to the kingdom we leave up to the Father. We don't have to understand. They are in the Father's charge. But I'm going to answer a question for you guys that you asked me a few days ago. Remember when you guys asked me who gets to be the greatest and I brought that child in front of you? When the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers and Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. Watch this. 
Whosoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. James, John, Karen. Oh, she's already Karen, so we're just going to leave it there. I don't know. The way in is possible. Indeed, you can drink the cup. It's just not going to be what you look like, what, what you think it looks like. It's going to be like that story I told you about the kid. Because you're going to have to become like him. And what's that going to look like? You want to be first, you're going to have to be the slave. You don't come to be served, you come to serve, to give your life as a ransom for many. You aren't anyone's savior, but you're going to participate by giving who you are into who he is so that he gives who he is into who you are. And that's the kingdom of God. And it's not just one day. It is the constant life of realizing that the stories of Jesus are the laying down of what I thought I had coming to take what he has paid for me. Let me give you just a practical example. Did you know that forgiveness, forgiveness is a beautiful example of death because when you forgive someone, you die to the right to get paid back. You die to the right to be right. And if you're not willing to die to it, you don't forgive. But forgiveness is a death. And we see death constantly in the Gospels as us laying aside what we thought was ours by rights to pick up what is his and take it into who we are. And so Jesus has provided us with the template that the way in is to actually be the biggest loser. That the way of the cross, the way of the scandal is to identify with the world's greatest loser who loses so that he wins because he says that that victory comes out of that grave. It's not just that victory is coming out of the grave. It's that victory comes out of the grave. Victory only comes from the empty tomb. So wind the film down with that final poignant scene. You got to have that final scene in a drama, that thing that kind of ties it all together. One of my favorites, I mean, I take you back for a moment in that time when Jesus takes that hand, he lays it on those little kids' heads, and there's just chaos all around him, and Jesus puts that blessing. He puts that blessing, that hand of blessing on an undeserving kid. It's not his kid, but it's an undeserving kid, and yet they receive that hand of blessing because in type and shadow, it's the inheritance of God on all of us undeserving kids, right? All of us who can't earn it, who can't possibly pay for it. Aged Jacob is on his deathbed. The Bible tells us at the end of the book of Genesis that the sons of Jacob all march in front of their patriarchal father as he is dying, and the patriarch speaks something into their life and lays his hands on each of them as they pass by. Technically, under, Jewish, under the Jewish inheritance, he would have, if he laid hands on them, he would have been laying that left hand on all of those sons as they came through because what was preserved, what was saved, was that right hand of blessing, that right hand of inheritance. That goes to his chosen firstborn. Well, his firstborn by blood has been disqualified. According, we're not going to go through the whole story in the book of Genesis, but he's been disqualified by action. And so the, the son of his choice and of his old age is both Joseph and Benjamin. So Joseph comes in, and in front of his father, he brings his two sons in, Manasseh and Ephraim. And old Jacob reaches out to bless Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob, the, Joseph, the Bible gives you this interesting blocking moment. Blocking is a stage term that means walk downstage and stand there before you say that line. Walk over here and pick up this cup before you say that line. And if you don't do that, then your, other, your fellow actors lose their cues. They don't know what's going on. And so the blocking in a stage set will include things that the audience never sees in print, but they see in action. 
Genesis takes the curtain and pulls it back and says, Joseph walked his sons Manasseh and Ephraim in before his father. And he put Manasseh on his left hand and he put Ephraim on his right hand. And then he pushed his sons towards his father so that his father's right hand would be on the boy on his left side and his left hand would be on the boy on his right side. There's all these verses in Genesis that it almost seem like redundancy of, God, of, of you just hearing all of this stuff. But then you start to realize that that left hand of blessing Blessing has been on all can be on all of the sons, but that right hand of blessing, that's the blessing, that's the inheritance of the whole family. That's the double portion. That's the one. The Bible says that as those two boys, Manasseh walking towards his right hand because Manasseh is the oldest boy, and Ephraim walking towards his left hand because he's the youngest boy, as they approach Jacob, he takes his hands and he crosses them over. And he lays his right hand on the head of Ephraim, and he lays his left hand on the head of Manasseh. And the Bible says, Joseph yells out, Dad, you're doing it wrong. And he grabs his dad's hands to uncross them. And Jacob says, no, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. The oldest is going to serve the youngest. And what I see in that is a prescient moment to the cross. Manasseh's name in the Hebrew is forgets, or he makes me to forget. Ephraim's name in the Hebrew means fruitful. And so when Jacob crosses his arms, he forgets the eldest to make the youngest fruitful. That which doesn't belong to the lowest end of the ladder lands on the lowest end of the ladder in Jacob's blessing. Because at Calvary, what God really does at the cross, I know in the scene, his arms are out. But if you could see behind the curtain, God crosses his arms at the cross and lays his nail-scarred hand on all of us that come to him like that kid. And when he puts that hand upon us as the child, he says, this is what the kingdom looks like. A bunch of those of you who know you can't earn it, you can't deserve it, and you just revel in being dad's children. Live in that, love that, express that. Go out there and be the biggest loser. (laughs) That's not much of a winning sermon. (laughs) He who loses this life, Jesus said, for my sake, he finds it. He goes, though a man be dead and he believe in me, he shall live. How's a dead man believe in him? That's how you came into the kingdom. The man who knew he was dead, who believed in the living Jesus and accepted his death as your death. And Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, and thus we conclude that if one man died, all men died. Wow. So you're already there. The reality is just own up to it. You're that diaper-filling kid bouncing on daddy's knee and that's where you need to be that's where you need to be and that will be where you don't have to be kept humble that'll keep you there that'll be where you don't have to squash selfish ambition there won't be any that'll be where the fruit of the spirit comes alive there are some of you who have a lot of good works and a lot of good things. And I feel the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to cut off some of your good fruit because the master husbandman cuts off good fruit in John 15 so that you can produce better fruit. Sometimes I think we think that pruning is God getting rid of all that's bad with us. Pruning is God getting rid of what we are proud of oftentimes. Because Jesus said, if you abide in me, you bring forth much fruit. He says, my father takes the branch that has good fruit and prunes it so that it brings forth more good fruit. Why in the world would you prune a branch with good fruit? Because there's more in you. And the master is going to bring it out. Let's lay that in front of him. Whatever that looks like. Father, thank you. I thank you because so many of these moments I, 
I, I sense you pulling something out of that deep well you've put in us. Sometimes you take me down a road, I have to trust to hold your hand as we go down it. We've done that a few times tonight. I pray that we've moved out of the way so that Christ shines forth. I pray that, Father, we have done, if we've done anything, we've put the spotlight on Jesus, that we've made Jesus look good, that we have shown Jesus as the centerpiece of the sermon. We've laughed. We've had fun. We've enjoyed ourselves. But, Lord, at the end of the day, it's identifying with the fact that coming to you means we are not who we used to be. We are the beginning of who you have us to be. And I want to grow in that. And I know there are people in this place that do as well. Do your pruning as only you can do. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. I love you, church. God bless you. Jamie. thinking that's some rich stuff right there uh, that's not that's not just candy but yet kids love candy um, that's that's actually more meat I, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the message of death is the message of life we just don't like to talk about it especially sometimes in gray circles because we do identify with him but our identity comes down to everything he did for us and as us his death was our death that's why we don't just die someday and go to heaven the truth is we died 2,000 years ago and went to heaven when he did I think we need to stop freaking out about whether we're going to get into heaven or not because before we were ever born, he seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I mean, are we there yet? We started there. It's not about trying to, to get somewhere, because I, I think there's a huge difference between getting in Christ and getting in the kingdom. You know, the, 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 the kingdom is a whole nother ball game. We can, we're born in this world. In him you live and move and have your being. Born now in Christ because Jesus was the last Adam. No one's been born in Adam for 2,000 years. Not everybody knows they're in Christ. That's the, the struggle is we're trying to inform people of where their position actually is. But entering the kingdom, that's, that's walking in righteousness. It's walking in peace and joy. Many of you have heard me say this many times. Inheriting the kingdom has nothing to do with getting into heaven. Inheriting the kingdom, you don't get an inheritance after you die. You get an inheritance while you're still living because someone else died. Inheriting the kingdom is us walking this thing out. What Jesus did because one man died, all died. When he rose, all rose. The beauty of this good news is now informing people of what he already did. That's why it's news. It's what already took place. And uh, I think we're just finally getting to a place to figure some of that stuff out. I think Paul made it so clear on Mars Hill, telling a bunch of pagans, don't you already know that you're in him and you're all his offspring? Don't you know you're already his child? Don't, don't, you, don't you already know and realize that this thing is already done and it's already finished, but it doesn't mean you've experienced it. It doesn't mean you've applied it by faith. It doesn't mean you've appropriated it. It is objectively true, but subjectively you need to experience it. That's why it's not the truth that makes us free. It's the knowledge of the truth. It's knowing it, having an intimate relationship with the truth. That's why Paul said men would ever be learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. That means you can go from conference to conference, podcast to podcast, and until you have an encounter with truth, and gnosko and actually know it, your life is not fully transformed and changed. It can be true of you, but you don't know it. And the gospel is an announcement now of really what's true of you. And he died when you did. That's, that's a beautiful thing. 